Okay, welcome to Denbydale Amateur Radio Club. Uh, really delighted uh, to see people again uh, this evening uh, for a meeting, an online meeting of Denbydale Amateur Radio Club. And uh, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Rick, uh, DJ Zero IP, and uh, his call sign, of course, as he's put on his uh, note there is also uh, G5. BMH because he also holds a UK call sign. Um, I'm just also going to say uh, hello now to uh, viewers on YouTube who are now live on YouTube as well as on Zoom. So good evening to those of you uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, can I, by way of introduction, just uh, introduce uh, Rick in in a couple of words? Really, uh, Rick, like many of us, uh, started his journey on amateur radio as a young man, in Rick's case, uh, playing with a crystal set. And uh, and then discovering uh, these uh, guys talking, apparently, on the radio. Uh, in those days, of course, radio amateurs used AM, uh, because we're looking back now to the 1950s. And, um, uh, and Rick uh, asked his dad about it, and uh, his journey into amateur radio began as a shortwave listener, as it's done for quite a few people in this room. Uh, Rick was first licensed in uh, 1962, I believe, Rick, um, in the US, and then uh, moving to Germany to get his German license in 1972, and then uh, later on getting his UK license as well. Uh, Rick is, um, uh, I think, as I've uh, said before to people here, is uh, a founder of Spider Beam US, uh, the uh, the company that uh, makes the spider beam antenna used by so many people, including Denby Dale Amateur Radio Club. And if you look very carefully at the picture behind me on the screen here of one of our field days a couple of years ago at Farnley Tice, you'll see sticking out of my head just at the top there, uh, the uh, spider beam, the club spider beam uh, that um, is uh, used from time to time. Uh, Rick is also the founder of the uh, Aerial 51, uh, making lightweight antennas and at one stage um, high specification transceivers as well, um, and uh, has got a lifetime of uh, amateur radio activity, uh, contesting a particular interest of his, as you'll find out in a second. So Rick, uh, you and I came to meet each other through uh, uh, talking about the off-center fed dipole, and I was wanting to find out more about uh, the the issues about building off centre fed dipoles, how they worked, the problems with them, and how they could be made better. And I came across you and came across your websites, and thought, here's someone who's got a wealth of information that really needs to be given a platform. So, Rick, I'm going to pass the microphone over to you and uh, hand over to you to um, uh, take the mic and uh, take us away this evening. Okay, it says unmute myself. Now you are okay. unmuted. You are unmuted, Rick. Yeah, you're fine. Well, guys, I worked 35 years in IT as a technical marketing manager. gave lots of presentations, but never one like this. Uh, you know, back then you carried along slides, and or you could shoot with a beamer, and the people we were talking to were close enough that you could see the whites of their eyes. And uh, the last time the Brits and the Yanks could see each other's whites of the eyes, I think they were shooting at each other. So uh, we will not be shooting tonight. So, um, so I hope I don't click anything wrong and every now and then my internet fails. So if I disappear, I'll be back in two or three minutes, something like that. So, um, and thank you, Nick, for inviting me. The only thing is if you had told me I have to, do this one day after Emil gives his presentation. I'm not sure I would have accepted it. I would have said, can we wait a week or two? It's a hard act to follow. So I, I'm very enthusiastic about wire antennas, always have been. Not as enthusiastic as Emil is about his rock climbing and, and, and his activities and all that. So let's see. I just clicked something and nothing happened. There we go. Um, my ham history is all posted. I didn't want to get into a long dissertation on that. It's posted on one of my websites, I have three. All of the links are at the very end, the last slide, as well as a dedicated uh, email address for questions. So I'd like to get going. At the moment, I've got the menu blocking my view of my screen. <laughs> okay, in part one, it's about what is OCFD and how good are they? 
Why not OCFD? A lot of people hate him, hate them. So what are the alternatives? Uh, why does OCFD have a shady reputation? Is it uh, accurate or not? And uh, this is one extra for you guys in the UK, at least the Balin, to be or not to be. How can the OCFD work multiple bands without any traps or tricks or anything like that? And why does it not work 15 meters? Show you some tricks for making it work. Once we understand why it doesn't work 15 meters, you'll see how easy it is to make it work on 15 meters. But now here's the kicker. I, I'm in several groups. Some of you are in the groups with me, different groups in Facebook or groups I owe about antennas. And we're always hearing people say, I've built this or I've built that, and it works. And they list maybe three stations that they've worked. And they consider that work. And, you know, that's sort of a, that's open for, for dis, uh, discussion. You know, what is the difference between work and work right? And I plan to give you my view of that. And the most important part is not tonight. Uh, that's going to come in the next presentation. And I think it's about three weeks. And once we go through all the technology, then it'll be easy to understand why I do things the way I do, why I build the antennas the way I build them. Before we get going, <laughs> I've got the menu again blocking my 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 uh, <laughs> part of my screen. But anyway, this presentation uses abbreviations. And the reason talking you can't talk about OCFD antennas without talking about common mode current. And that's just too long to write out on every slide. So I abbreviated it CMC which, you know, some people don't like. but um, So I define that this is RF flowing on the outer surface of the coaxial shield. The confusion is the, the acronym CMC elsewhere often means common mode choke. Well, I'll talk about the common mode chokes as well, but I, I'll just call them chokes. And if I write CMC, I mean common mode current. More important, I think, is common mode impedance. This is the measurement in ohms of the ability of an RF choke or a ballon to impede the flow of common mode current on the feed line. And the final term, this is one I invented, SWR min. And what I mean is the frequency at which we have minimum SWR, you know, on each band. And writing all that out with, was a mouthful and, you know, half a screen full. So I just came up with the uh, term SWR min. It's stated in megahertz. You know, so I don't mean, you know, two to one or three to one. I mean, you know, 3.562 kilohertz or something like that. The last one should be apparent. I, I use ATU and, and you know, I like to say antenna matchbox. That's what we called them 60 years ago. Today, most people say antenna tuner or antenna tuning unit. All the same. I abbreviated ATU because once again, I don't want to write out long words. Now, a lot of what I tell today is going to contradict what you've heard or read or even done yourself. And uh, I've got a reason for doing it differently. And when I first put my presentation together, it was about three times as long as it is now. So I had to shorten it. So I took a lot of the information, which is basically just backup information with links to other the people I call gurus like W8JI and VK1OD and G3TXQ, et cetera. And if I have a page where I'm talking about technology and I don't want to go too deeply into it, I'll, I'll put this little yellow embedded in yellow link sign, which means if you go to the link page and for part one, it's this uh, URL. If you get the PDF, this should be active. You should be able to click it and go to it. So you go to that page, find slide number three, and there you'll find the whatever information I added in to back that up. The next thing I like to do is uh, quote a very, very famous American who lived 180 years ago. He speaks my kind of English because I'm from down south. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So, some of, if not a lot of what I talk about today is, like I said, it's going to contradict what you, you have learned elsewhere, elsewhere on the internet. And, and I'd remind you, it's the same internet that claims that John Lennon is, is alive and living together with Elvis on a side street near Piccadilly Circus, you know, so you can find just about anything. And the trouble is, with balance and OCFD antennas, a lot of what we find just ain't so. Now, if he was alive today, Mark Twain would just say this is fake news. Basically, I'd warn everybody to be very careful 
in trying to learn about balance on the internet, be careful to use reliable sources. Uh, these are the sources I used while I was learning. These are in alphabetical order. Uh, no particular order. The only thing is if you're starting out and learning, I highly re uh, recommend this. And like I said, the links, you go to the, the page supporting this slide and you'll find links to the webs or blogs of these different guys. But this is a good place to start. Uh, Roy Lavallon, Lewallen, actually, is it balance what they do and how they do it. And uh, you're probably all familiar with the term voltage balance and current balance. And those terms did not exist before he wrote this document. It was published in the ARRL Antenna Compendium, Volume 1. And every year at uh, Dayton, he gives a presentation on balance. And so if you really want to learn what they do, you should read this. Now, if you think you know pretty well what they do, you probably ought to read it again. And if you know for sure what they do, then for sure you ought to read it again and make sure that you know for sure because, you know, it's what you don't, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so that gets you into trouble. So, like I said, all of these, I think every word these guys have ever written, I've, I've read three to five times in my long path to learning what I learned about the balance and the OCFD antennas. First of all, what is an OCFD antenna? Well, you know, I think most people have a vague idea of what it is. It's a dipole. It's a half wavelength long coax fed. It's the successor to the single wire Wyndham antenna to the original. That was 1928. It's a half wavelength long on its lowest band. And it's fed somewhere between its center and one end of the antenna. How well does it work? Well, for many years, I thought these were lousy because I, I built a single wire fed Wyndham in 1963. And I played at it again in 72 with a coax fed and I wasn't happy with the antennas. But then at one point, and I'll come to that in a minute when we look at my QTH and you see why I had to switch to the uh, OCFD antenna. So after I got mine perfected, a friend of mine was gonna work the IOTA contest in 2015. Let me get my mouse down here. I loaned him an Aerial 51 model 807 UL. The 807 UL is not so. First of all, let me say Aerial 51 does not build the antennas. We do not sell the antennas. We're just three guys that play with antennas. Spider Beam has chosen to build and sell some of my antennas. And the, the 807 UL is not in the program, but the 807 HD and, and the uh, the portable one, the lightweight one, 807 LR. So Paul took along a K3, my antenna, and a 12 meter fiberglass pole. He entered the class uh, expedition, island expedition class single op running 100 watts. And he took first place overall worldwide. Another friend of mine in the States, uh, Barry and one of you, I sent him an Aerial 51 404 UL when I first uh, designed the antenna. And he used it in the, the take it to the field QRP contest. We don't know this contest over here, but over in their side of the pond, the you know, North America, South America, that's uh, quite a popular contest. And Barry took first place overall of all the operators. So, you know, I'm not saying they did it because of my antenna, but they certainly did it despite my antenna. Uh, you know, I mean, the... You can't do it with a bad antenna. He probably could have done it with a couple of other antennas, but you can't have a bad antenna and, and win a contest like that. But now how well does this work for me? This is my beautiful QTH and I call it Ham Hill. And I was living in the States, as, as Nick said, I founded Spider Beam US. Uh, actually, I moved over there from here, founded Spider Beam US. And after four years, we were ready to come back and I got someone that would take over my company for me. My XYL came home ahead of time. She was house hunting, but I actually found this location. I found it in the internet, looked at it on Google Maps, sent her over. She looked at it. She said, honey, it's beautiful. I said, yeah, but you know, we, we're renting. We didn't buy it. And we live here where you see the open window. And the landlord lives just above us. I said, you got to get in writing permission for an antenna. And she got it. And I said, well, sign the lease. 
Of course, in Google Maps, you don't see mountains. And I was shocked when I got here to see the mountains all around me. I thought, I'll never get out of this place. And my antenna, my 80-meter OCFD antenna, which wasn't my first, but it was mounted here. And you can see to, to shoot stateside, I've got like about a 60-degree angle and towards Japan, about a 40-degree angle or something like that. Now, I, I've got a pretty good shot to the south, but, uh, you know, Actually, that's where I need a mountain because the Italians are so loud, <laughs> but the mountains are in the wrong place. So I'm a contester, got on the air with my OCFD antenna, which was the second antenna I put up. Come to that in a minute. Here's a couple of years results. Lost the logbook here. I don't work so many hours. I didn't back then. 30 hours. That was my best year. If you've ever worked CQ Worldwide and you don't have a beam and all you have is wires, scoring a million points is a bit difficult. And uh, that was my best year. The next year, I didn't have time for the CW contest. The XYL had other plans. And just take a look at the run rates down here. Was, so every 1.4 minutes, I had a QSO for 30 hours continuously. And every five minutes, a new country. So how does it work on QRP? And I, I love to work QRP. As Nick mentioned, for a short period, actually for about four years, I arranged a deal between a company manufacturing these antennas and spider beam themselves to sell it. And at the time I was working for spider beam. And so we were selling these little radios. I think I said antenna to these little radios and I was using the little five watt radio and a, you know, aerial 51 antenna, the 80 meter OCFD, um, 15 hours on the air. These were 54 countries on 80, 60 countries, actually 61, but I messed up a call sign on one. So, you know, it's not proof that you have the greatest antenna going, but it does prove that it's not bad. You know, if you look at the run rates again, every 1.7 minutes was a QSO and every six minutes was a new country. So it does work pretty good. And most recently, last month, there was a group of guys from my contest uh, club were operating East Timor. The last day they were on the air, I thought, well, I better go work them or else uh, I'll miss them. So I got on at about 10 o'clock at night and took me 10 minutes to work them, but I was running 500 watts. So it's not proof that this is the greatest antenna in the world, but it proves that it isn't bad. Now, I said I didn't have my OCFD as a first antenna. This is on the right here. This has always been my favorite multiband antenna. It's I call it a double zip. Some people call it a doublet. It's It's a dipole usually cut for the lowest band and fed with 300 ohm, 450, 300, whatever you have and some kind of tuner. Keep it simple. Works all bands. You just have to use the tuner all the time. I showed you our house before. The, the antenna worked great, but the bad news was the feed line ran through the air right past the picture window of the living room of my landlord. And after about two days, he says, that's got to go. So I had to take it down and find something else. But what do you take? You know, I wanted an all-band antenna. I wanted to contest. I'd love to have one with no antenna tutor. So I started searching. And I, these were the factors. It's subjective, obviously. You know, does it need a tuner? How much does it cost? How much space? Weight? Since I use fiberglass poles, because I get them for free, you know, then I was looking for something that wasn't too heavy, good reliability. I didn't matter, or it doesn't matter to me much about aesthetics, but uh, if you have a landlord and XYL and neighbors, it matters. And complexity, I believe in keeping it simple. So I've got a few antennas I looked at. These ones outlined in red, I call contraption antennas. The, the more gain, I didn't look at it very long. Trap dipole, well, it's got trap built into contraption, so that's practically the epitome of a contraption. This is a good on the top right, the uh, fan dipole is a good antenna, but as soon as you want a whole bunch of bands, it's it's kind of a contraption as well. And by the way, as it's pictured here, it's it does have a, a gotcha. This slide was borrowed from Martin with his position um, permission. Uh, DL, what's a DL seven ZB? And uh, I've got actually on this linked page a document where I examined all of these antennas, wrote lots of details, and then tried to be subjective and the advantages and disadvantages of each antenna. It ended up being a document 19 pages long, so you might not want to read it, but it does go into quite a lot of detail. Now, here's a couple of antennas that aren't so bad. I use this 
50 years ago, I had a beam, so I only needed 80-40. It worked well until the traps waterlogged. So I said, well, traps really aren't the thing. I've never used the G5RV or the ZS6BKW, and if I were going to, I'd use the BKW. Um, the reason was, if you go to all this trouble, you may as well just run it a little bit longer and run the wire all the way to the shack. Just use a matchbox. Now, here's my least favorite antenna, and I would never use one in it. For some reason, the entire internet seems to think this is this is the berries these days. Everybody's talking about in-fed antennas. I wouldn't have one. You've got CMC issues. You've got some other problems with it. And by the way, if I absolutely had to feed this antenna or any antenna off of its end, there's a better choice. It's called an in-fed, off-center fed dipole. You know, no, in-connected, off-center fed dipole, ECOCFD. A friend of mine published an article on this in Radcom about five years ago. It's a Rob M0RZF. Uh, he didn't call it that. It's something about an infed Wyndham or something was the name of it. 2018, it was in a Radcom issue. And if you really want to find it, and if you write me, send me an email, I'll look up the, the, uh, the issue and you can look it up. So like I said, uh, those were all the things I looked at. But, you know, they're all complicated. And I like this. Keep it simple. So I took another look at the OCFD antenna. It's just a wire with a ballon in it. You know, you, you cut it open somewhere, you ins insert a ballon. But why had I had bad luck with it before? I mean, I, I had the Fritzl FD4 and it was just, it was always down about two S units over any dipole I compared it to. The first thing I'd like to say, and no matter what you do, you must choke the the OCFD antenna. And I don't care what ballon, unless you use a very special new type of ballon called a hybrid ballon, which has a choke built into it, you should always use an external choke. And we'll look at why that is a little bit later. And it's one of the biggest mistakes most people make when they build them is they, they don't do that. So this is the classic shown here. It's approximately to scale one third, two thirds. Overall length is, it's, it's an 80 meter dipole, this one was. And it works 80, 40, 20, and 10. A lot of people say, hey, it works even harmonics. And there's even some manufacturers, ballon manufacturers, they claim this does not work on, on 17 or 12 meters. That's absolutely wrong. This is an outstanding antenna, low SWR. It's a good performer. This antenna works in those bands. What it does not work is 30 or 15 meters. So, I mean, it looked really great, but as a contester, you know, I got to have 15 meters. I mean, without 15 meters, you you can't work a contest, really. At least you can't win. So the question was, why does it not work 15 meters? And, well, the first thing you'd notice, 1928, when the, the original Wyndham was designed, 15 meters wasn't even a ham band, you know, so obviously, but they weren't even really looking for, for multiband performance. They were looking for something else. But, you know, there's obviously some technical reasons why it didn't work, and you, you got to find them. So the next thing I want to look at is wh where did the OCFD get its shady reputation from? So, you know, there's some people swear by it, others swear at it. You know, some people think it's the greatest things in sliced spread, and others say, hey, it's a dummy load, it's a TVI generator, harmonic generator, uh, what's the truth? Well, it's, it's installation dependent. And I got into a bit of a, I don't want to say argument, but, you know, Tom, uh, WHAI, he, he disagreed with this, but I'll tell you, I, I've not actually had mine over a metal roof, but I've done this before and even worse. You know, we've all learned you should always run your feed line perpendicular to your radiator. You can't always do that. Sometimes you do have to run it, you know, skewed off to one side. And that's when you start to get into trouble with OCFD. And if you don't have the world's best ballon and a choke, you can get into some serious problems. And I'm certain you're going to get into that problems with this as well. So the fundamental problem is this antenna is so susceptible to common mode current and much more so, far more so. And by the way, I've measured this and I've got posted on website measurements where you can see the difference. We'll look at a couple of things. So, and you, if you don't have a perfect installation and a great ballon, you can get into trouble. You can have a less than perfect, but it really must be a good ballon. Here's the second problem. All of the manufacturers, almost all, there's a couple of exceptions, but very few, are running single core four to one Guanella ballons. At least they think they're running a ballon. 
actually this is not even a Bowen, it's just a transformer. Why that is has been explained in detail by G3TXQ on his website, by WHJI, by VK10D on his blog. And I can even show you my measure results, which prove that it does not work. It's just not suitable. The simple fix, of course, to these problems is just use good balance and choke technology. Unfortunately, I don't know of any commercial vendor that's doing this well enough. I know two that are building pretty good hybrid balance that sometimes work, but not always. And of course, the spider beam one does. Uh, you know, I designed it and it works like I designed it. Been tested by a, a German magazine. You can read the magazine article in English on my website. So until the OCFD manufacturers do, you know, do their homework and, and fix these balance, they're, they're never going to get the antenna right. As easy solution is do it yourself. And this is easier than you think. The biggest problem everybody says they have is the balance, you know, and it seems like everybody is scared. Okay, I learned yesterday from Emo, it's allowed to use this word. I wasn't sure, but they're, they're scared shitless to build their first balance. I was too. You're afraid you're going to mess something up. You're not going to get it right. It isn't going to work right. So I never met anyone in my life that was not afraid to build the first balance. And likewise, I never met anyone who was afraid to build their second balance. After they did it, they laughed at themselves. It's so darn easy. And we'll learn how to do that, but it's going to be in part two. Okay, let's look at common mode current for a moment. If we take a half wave antenna, if I can find my mouse, half wave antenna, a dipole on any frequency, any band, and we feed it dead center, this is the point where you'll have minimum problems with common mode current, especially if you run your feed line 90 degrees, you know, perpendicular to the antenna. And when we move off center towards the end, the farther away we go, the worse tendency to generate common mode current there is. And though it's absolutely worst at the end. And this is why I don't like in-fed antennas, in-fed half-wave antennas. Quarter wave is a different story, but in-fed half-wave antennas. So why do they even exist? Well, they were called a Hertz antenna and then a Marconi antenna, and, and they were used on Zeppelins. And when you're flying about in a Zeppelin, it's about the only kind of antenna you can put out there is, a, you know, a trailing piece of wire. But I don't know any hams that fly Zeppelins, so I don't see why they insist on using in-fed antennas. This text just says what I just told you. So let's move on to the next. When, what really happens? Why does the, an, the antenna perform so poorly? whenever it has common mode current on it. And the reason is when it has common mode current, the feed line becomes part of the antenna and dirty things begin to happen. And uh, contrary to uh, what some people think, that's not my mother-in-law. Anyway, the expected antenna characteristics are distorted and skewed and they can be severely dis distorted. The frequency of minimum SWR shifts, it usually shifts upward and it can shift several hundred kilohertz upwards. The level of minimum SWR changes. It can get better or worse. Both change when you, you change the length of coax. And this is the kicker. You, you build an antenna at home, you tune it, and if it has common mode current on it, you think it's you know tuned for resonance or, or actually for SWR minimum. Then you take it someplace else to the field and it doesn't work like it did at home because you change the length of coax. Sometimes you even lose coverage of a single band or, or two bands. And you'll have RF on the feed line. I think everybody has knows that or has experienced it. And it can radiate all the way to the shack. I'll show you in another few slides how just how strong that can be. The chassis, the mic, the key may all be hot. At a very early age, 50 years ago, I switched from a metal mic to an all-plastic mic for this reason. So I used for many years a Shure 444, all plastic, and that, that, that cured the hot lips problem. But I've also had problems with circuit breakers, especially in Tintec power supplies, circuit breakers tripping to fault, and consumer products in your house may be affected, and, and your neighbors may soon be pounding on your door, and they won't be bringing champagne. 
So the next thing I have to scroll back up to read the top because I've got a little menu up here covering my, my top line. Okay, there's two types of balance with significant differences. Oh, and by the way, I am sort of fighting off a cold and my voice is kind of scratchy. That's why I keep drinking tea. So we have two types of balance, and I guess everybody knows this. Maybe we haven't called them that, but you'll recognize them. The, the transmission line balance, it's a one-to-one -one balance. Now, I don't know if I can find myself I'm here. This would be a typical one like here, this, just a, a toroid with, with a coax wrapped around it. That's a transmission line balance. The transformer balance, of course, transforms the uh, the impedance ratio, four to one, nine to one, 49 to one, et cetera. Now with these transform balance, again, like this, the good news is you have a coax coming in one side and out the other, and the power is transferred or the energy is transferred just through the coax inside the coax. It's a wired path. With the transformer balance, it's transferred via flux coupling between the conductors, you know, from input to output. So the balance core is at least partially involved in the energy transfer, and you always have some loss. Now, all of the info on this page is taken directly from Tom Rauch, WHAI, from his page. Suggest you read that. And this is just the highlights. The good news with the transmission line balance, because everything is just flowing right through the coax inside, it's hardly affected by the amount of power uh, nor by a mismatch. Unfortunately, transformer balance, power and mismatch range limited by magnetizing forces to the core. So and this, this is how Tom summarized it. By the same size and quality of material, transformer balance handle less power into match loads and significantly less power into mismatch loads than transmission line bal balance do. So keeping that in mind, we're going to look at the, the ideal, sorry to run it up and down, but like I say, but I can't get rid of this, this menu here. No, I don't know how to get rid of it. So it, it always blocks my title, my slide title. Okay, anyway, the transformer, excuse me, the, the OCFD balance must perform two tasks, transform impedance and impede the flow of common mode current. And by the way, the one on the right, this is the primary this is secondary. If we look at the transformer balance taken from what we saw in the previous slide, uh, first of all, they have only moderate CMI. Uh, I'll show you why that is actually in the next slide, but they have moderate CMI compared to the uh, transformer balance. Oh, excuse me, compared to the transmission line balance. These work best with low permeability but we need high permeability to get high uh, CMI. So it's, you know, it's uh, counterproductive there to use it. But here's the important thing. The CMI degrades when the SWR rises. Well, we don't always have perfect SWR with an OCFD antenna. And so if you have higher SWR, the CMI degrades and then more common mode current starts to flow. And that warms the core. And as it warms the core, the CMI degrades and you have uh, more common mode current and you can eventually get thermal runaway. Not so with the transmission line ballon. First of all, the transmission line ballon has twice as much common mode impedance as a similar uh, transformer ballon. You'll see why on, uh, when I show pictures of these on the next or drawings. These maintain their CMI even when you have high SWR, the, you know, you don't lose common mode impedance. And you can use a high permeability without endangering the toroid because power flows inside the coax. It does not use the core for the transfer. So the bottom line is we, we've got two tasks and there's no reason to try to do them both with one single ballon. Let's do them with two. And you're going to be maybe amazed, but this is actually, where's my camera? If I can get this thing into view, this little guy here. This was the other one that I showed you before. And it's hard to get them both into here. And it, it's uh, quite a bit larger. It's what a lot of the commercial ballon vendors use. Nevertheless, customers continue to burn those ballons up, even though they're much larger. And with my little one here, well, 
Spider-Beam rates it at 600 watts. That's SSB and CW. And there's lots of lots of users I personally know that run a kilowatt through them. This tiny little things here, but it's designed properly. If you design them wrong, then it doesn't matter what size they are; they're going to burn up. So the main problem is the ballon, and as I said, almost all commercial OEMs are building these wrong. They don't understand the unique CMI requirements of the OCFD antenna. I did a field test in 2013. It lasted three weeks. Uh, to prepare for that, a lot, of, a lot of people, some of you might know, helped me. Um, G3TXQ was very helpful. G3UNA was very, very helpful. In fact, he kind of held my hand every day by telephone and email. And he was friends with um, Ian White, a GM3 SEK, and Ian gave me lots of information to prepare for the test. I made 500 measurements, and we're going to look at a couple of them in a moment. But what I discovered was the common mode current problem with OCFD antennas is like 95% on its fundamental. And whenever you go to the higher harmonic bands, it just suddenly falls off dramatically. You don't need anywhere near the common mode impedance on the higher bands that you need on the fundamental. So you don't have to build a broadband ballon. You have to build a ballon that has a lot of common mode impedance on the fundamental band. This is what the, the OEMs, the vendors, fail to do. So some of them, though, they don't even understand how the 4 to 1 Guanella ballon works because they're still building ballons that don't work right, the single core. But as I've written here, in my opinion, it's not their fault, and you're going to be surprised to see what I put up next. Now, Jerry Sevick has written W2FMI, an outstanding book over balance. It's basically about how to build balance. The book is excellent. It has a couple of mistakes and a couple of a couple of serious mistakes in it. And this is one of them. He shows us two ways to build a, a, a four to one Guanella or current ballon, but only one of them works with HF antennas. And the kicker is with HF antennas. That's what he left out. That's what he failed to say. Now, Jerry worked for Bell Labs, and all of his work was done on, on, on networks, and the networks were floating completely ground independent. Well, HF antennas are not ground independent, and this is explained very well in detail with lab measurements and mathematically by G3TXQ, WHAI, VK1OD. They all go in and tell you about this and tell you why it doesn't work. Yet almost every ballon vendor out there is selling these things. And that, that's one of the biggest problems. So bring in the two dots there. These ballons, basically the single core, they're just transformers because they don't have any common mode impedance at all. Absolutely zero. And in the, uh, I should have, yeah. In the details page and commentary page i've got links to um there's a good document from g3txq where he shows actual measurements and proves this this thing has absolutely zero common mode impedance and the antenna probably the antenna the biggest antenna in the world that needs a good ballon this is the worst ballon you could pro possibly use and this is what many of the people selling them especially on ebay this is what they're using that's where the bad reputation comes from. So the linchpin lynch lynch to success or failure, it's the ballon. And with few exceptions, the four to one, the dual core four to one granella ballon, it, it doesn't have enough CMI to impede the common mode current. And the reason is what I said earlier, it has only half as much CMI as a one to one granella or one to one current ballon. Now, there's a few exceptions, very few, where that's enough, but almost most of the, the antennas we're going to want to build, it's not going to work by itself. Simple solution, of course, would be to use a choke. It's a bit more detailed than that, and we go into detail in part two, all about you know, what material to choose and why that one and why not something else and how many turns of this or that. That's all in part two. If you use a one-to-one -one choke, ballon together with your four to one ballon, you're going to be okay. Even if, oh, I shouldn't say even if, if you're running SSB and CW, if you're running data modes, you probably use the wrong core in your four to one ballon and you can have problem, you can have thermal runaway. And we'll get into that too later. So most commercial four to one ballons are inadequate. Many are even worthless. 
And this is a part that I said I was going to explain the differences and, and show just why they're so bad. Now, this is the ballon that's worthless. This is the single core. You've got two transmission lines. You have to have two transmission lines, but they're both wound on the same core. They have more turns, of course, but, uh, you know, I drew these by hand. So and this is a good one. Here they're so small, I couldn't, I didn't manage to, to wind the, the wire should be wound around like shown over here. But as you can see, each transmission line has its own dedicated core. This is a good ballon, much better. 100% adequate for many antennas, but in most cases inadequate for the OCFD antenna, unless you add a choke. And the problem is if you built the thing like most people recommend with number 43 uh, ferrite, it's got a low curry temperature. It's going to work okay in sideband, but if you're running digital modes, digi modes, you're going to find out that your balance starts, uh, well, it had, the SWR starts creeping. It's called SWR creep. And eventually can even get thermal runaway and eventually even break. So this bad ballon over here, now, now, like I said, the gurus of the industry, they, they explain why. And there's links on my web, website to, to, to read about them. The way this thing works, so in general, is you've got two one-to-one -one ballons like we see on the right. And here they're both on the same core. And we wire their inputs in parallel. If, if this is bifil bifiller or twisted pair, it's a, about 100 ohms. So you get about 50 ohms on the left wired in parallel. We we'll wire them in series on the output, and this gives us, you know, a four to one step up. It gives us, you know, 200 ohms on the output. So the first problem you see is if I wind, let's say I, I wind 10 turns over here on each of these, and I wind over here. Uh, I, I, first of all, you usually can't get that many turns on this because you've only got half of the space to do it. But, but the problem that you have when you've got inductors in parallel like this, inductors in parallel and they're both equal, then you have half the inductance. So for the purpose of common mode impeding, you only get half the inductance or the common mode impedance practically out of this transformer balance that you would get out of this, the uh, single core. So if I'm getting like 8,000 ohms, which is feasible out of a single core Guanella, I'm getting only 4,000. Now, in certain cases, that's enough. Other cases, it's not. And we'll look at that in detail later. This is another one where I missed it. So one core versus two core. Okay, now we're going to get into the 2B or not 2B. You know, when I first heard about this was 12 years ago when I was looking into building my first OCFD. And a friend of mine pointed out that Tom Rauch, WHAI, explains and says that, you know, that we should not use a single core. And I said, well, why not? You know, because every man and his dog is publishing designs for single core balance, four to one balance on the web. You know, what's the reason? And so I sent an email off to um, Tom, and uh, that was 12 years ago, and I haven't gotten an answer yet. I just asked him, you know, well, how much difference does it make? Surely it can't be that much or people wouldn't use it, and the ballon vendors wouldn't build them. Well, the bottom line, it is that much, and the, the silly ballon vendors are building them. So now let me show you what I did. Now, I, I said, okay, if nobody's going to tell me, I'm going to find out. So I devised a test to test this. I sure wish I, sure wish I could make this thing go away. I can't. Now, now I made it worse. I can't get rid of my menu. It covers this. What, what you can probably see, hopefully I can't see, up here is a 40-meter OCFD connected to a physical half wave, not an electrical, and a physical half wave of coax. Why physical? Well, common mode current does not flow inside the balance, uh, excuse me, inside the coax. It flows outside. And the electrical quarter wavelength is, let's say, 0 0.66 times uh, the physical, that's only inside the coax, not on the outside. So I was brainstorming with Steve, uh, this was a dozen years ago, uh, G3TXQ, and we said, you know, what's the velocity factor on the outside? It, it has to be, you know, like a big thick wire. So it's probably about 0 0.98. So roughly you need a physical half wavelength. You have the worst possible common mode current at the end of a physical half wavelength. And then I, 
I took the coax in order to create, to generate common mode current. I bent it as far as I could, actually more radical than is shown here. The, the end of it was only about five meters away from the radiator. And then I built my two core ballon, that's my 2B, and my single core ballon, that's not a 2B. And I measured it with a scanning analyzer. The curve looked pretty good down here, except I had measured a 40 meter dipole earlier. I knew how that looked. I had measured the same OCFD with the coax in a straight line. I knew how that looked. And how they looked with both ends, the curve was steeper. So this is actually flattened out as if somebody stepped on it. And it's common mode current causing it to flatten out. But it's not that bad. At least it looks like a dipole should look. Up here, I got a double dip. Now, if you only had an SWR bridge and you were measuring three or four places, you say, hey, great, this is a broadband antenna. Well, let's see how great it is. So that was step one, just to look at it uh, with an analyzer. Step two, I applied 100 watts to each of these. Now, this is the exact same antenna. All I did is swap the ballon. So the same antenna, same place, just you know, swapping the ballons back and forth. So I applied 100 watts to it, and I took a clamp on RF ammeter, and I clamped it on at the end. I mean, not just there. I clamped it on at several different places. I recorded all this. Worst case was at the end, and I measured how much, how much current am I getting? Well, as it turns out, I was getting 340 milliamps of current on the, the single core ballon, 105 milliamps of current on the, the dual core ballon, so, you know, first inclination, well, heck, that thing is three times as bad. Well, it's not as bad as I thought. Maybe that looks bad, but that's only three times as bad. Yeah, but, but wait a minute. What's, how much power is there actually on the feed line? So this got back to, once again, brainstorming with Steve. Well, what's the impedance of the feed line? So, well, it's thick wire. It might be 600 ohms, maybe 500, maybe 400. But let's run with 500 and calculate the power formula, I squared R, so if you take that and square it times 500 ohms, we have 58 watts. From 100 watts generated, we had 58 watts in the coax. How about down here? We have 5.5 watts. So this is not three times worse. It's 10 times worse than this. Yet people are buying these all the time. Uh, really good name val ballon uh, manufacturers are selling these for, and for lots of money. They're worthless. So this ballon would be okay if we added a choke to it. So let's get back to Mark Twain. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. So you might not have known that you uh, need a dual core ballon, but you probably think you can get by with a single core because after all, that's what everybody uses, isn't it? But that's what really gets you into serious, serious problems. It's just a total waste of money to spend even one quid on one of these ballons. So the 80 meter OCFD choke ballon. Yeah, <laughs> now I'm gonna click this next thing and I won't even be able to, to, to read it. So uh, what did it say? Something like this is probably the most important slide on the whole presentation. I hope it says that, I can't see it. I'm gonna show you two ballons. These are real life ballons, you know, the pictures I actually made myself here. And I built both of these. And I say, this is a code ballon. This is a hot ballon. Differential current is the current flowing inside the coax to and from the antenna. And if you have enough common mode impedance, you don't get common mode current. All of your current flows to and from the antenna inside. As long as, flow, as, long as it's flowing inside the coax, it pretty much does not heat the, uh, the toroid. Over here, this ballon happens to have insufficient CMI for an 80 meter OCFD antenna. Therefore, it has a lot of common mode current flowing on it. Show you what these are. These are real live ballons. The one on the left is a little one I showed you a moment ago, but it's using this is basically uh, number 43 ferrite. This is number 61 ferrite. They're Permeability, 850 on the left, only 125 on the right. We're using thicker coax, but, but we're using less turns, 13 turns on the left, 18 turns on the right. And using the, the charts from G3TXQ, this says we've got about 8,000 ohms here and only 500 ohms here. 
totally inadequate for an OCFD antenna. So what happens if you would try to use this, of course, you have common mode current flowing not only on the coax here, but flowing on the coax around the toroid. It'll start to heat the toroid. Okay, and this is the biggest ballon killer there is. Now, these two ballons, the one on the left is what I use in the, the uh, in spider beam uses in the 807 HD antenna. And this is the spider beam Yagi ballon. And, you know, Nick showed us one. In fact, you can see one just above his head there. And, uh, you know, the the five band or three band Yagis, they've got multiple mono band Yagis. The radiators are center fed. That's where you have the least common mode current. The, the beams are usually high and in the clear. And this is the common mode impedance that you get on the various bands where you can use this and th that's enough for that application it's definitely wrong for an 80 meter ocfd it would also be wrong to call this a bad ballon it's an outstanding outstanding ballon a w1jr ballon spider beam has been using this for 20 years over 3,000 antennas in the field so the only time i ever had i did tech support for 15 years for them so the only time i ever had a a bad ballon. It had a hair hairline crack inside of it, and uh, you know we sent them a new ballon for free, and that 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 cleared the, uh, the problem. You know, so good ballon, but it's the wrong ballon. That's what we have to watch out for because the people selling these don't know what they're doing. There's one or two exceptions, and I don't want to start naming good or bad. I'm certainly not going to name the bad ones, at least not in public. And I'm afraid if I name the good ones, then I'll have some others say, "Why didn't you name me?" So I'll just say there are good and bad do your own due diligence. Let's switch gears completely now. If anyone wants to take a stretch or, or so, we'll give about a 30 second to stretch or take a drink, which I'm going to do. I'm, I'm fighting off a cold and I'm, I'm having to drink all the time to keep my voice going. So we're going to go away from balance and we're going to see how do these things work? What enables them to work multiple bands with just a piece of wire? And it's not Harry Potter. The first thing we're going to do is look at a half wavelength on 80 meters, for instance, and we can see the distribution, you know, how the, the current and the voltage compare along the, the wire. And as you as we know, current is maximum in the middle of the dipole and we feed it there and it's minimum at its ends and voltage is vice versa. We also know if we feed it here at this point, we've got an impedance of about 50 to 70 ohms, something like that. It depends on the height above ground and the ground as well. Now, it makes no difference where we feed this antenna. We can feed it in the middle, in the end, or anywhere in between. Let's give it a place in between. Doesn't matter where we feed it. This relationship, voltage and current, it remains the same always. What changes, of course, is, is the impedance when we move along the axis here. So if we consider we've got about 50 to 70, say 60 ohms up here at the center, we could have 3,000, maybe 4,000 ohms, really high impedance down here. This place going to be maybe a couple hundred ohms if we feed it in here, right? So that's just general knowledge. So the question is, what happens if we bring in 40 meters? So let's let's bring in 40 meters. Okay. And by the way, voltage is not important. We're only going to look at current. So from the rest of the slides I show you now and how, how we make this work in the other bands, I'll only show current. I leave the voltage out. Before we look at 40 meters, so I, I, I want to reach an agreement. And this, this is where the speaker has the advantage. It's going to be a one-side agreement. Uh, you can challenge me in the questions afterwards or um, at the, uh, yeah, send me an email. But uh, I'll show you the gurus that confirm this. Anyway, we're going to look at SWR because, you know, that's what everybody looks at. That's what our transceivers want. So many people think that SWR indicates the performance of their antenna. It has absolutely nothing at all to do with performance of an antenna. It's, an it's a mathematical ratio, basically. It's an indication of a match or a mismatch between two devices. And one of the devices is a transmission line. The other could be the antenna or the transmitter. But it's just a ratio. It describes a little bit about the ability of the transmission line to deliver power from the transmitter to the uh, antenna. Tells us nothing about what the antenna does with the power once it gets it. And we're going to see on the next slide, you know, basically just how little difference most of the time that will make. 
Now, I'm not talking about 50 to 1 SWR. You know, if you've got 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. Uh, here's an important thing here. Minimum SWR is not an indication of resonance. I mean, I was guilty of this too, and sometimes I still do because this is what I called it for 50 years. But it's actually minimum SWR is, is just that. It's, it's SWR minimum. It's the frequency where you have minimum SWR, and it's not resonance. Now, it's not totally impossible, but you know, maybe once in every six blue moons, you might find an antenna that has it. Most of the time, they're fairly close together. But resonance is a frequency at which inductive and capacitive reactants are equal and cancel each other out. And we refer to it as J0. I'm going to try to remember to say SWR minimum, minimum throughout the presentation. If I say resonance, uh, probably mean SWR minimum. I usually catch myself, though, when I say it. So let's talk about loss due to SWR. Now, this is not total loss in your coax. This is the loss due to SWR. Uh, you all have heard for sure about Maxwell. I mean, he had the W2DU. Uh, um, no, no, excuse me, sorry. No, he didn't have the W. He had the Maxwell chokes. You know, that is a W2DU chokes, which if I can hold one up. Here's one here. It was a coax. You really can't see it very good in the camera right now. I'll switch cameras later and you can see them closer. Okay, those were the chokes he came out with. But anyway, he wrote a book and it's it's pretty much considered the Bible of transmission lines. And on page 1.8, he put this chart in here. It's the additional loss in dB due to SWR. And it's based on RG8, which at the time he wrote the book, wrote the book was pretty popular. And if we follow this up, and you know, 100 feet of RG8, if we follow this up at 3 to 1 SWR and we see where it crosses 4 megahertz and where it crosses 7 megahertz, we come across over here. It's less than 0 0.2 dB on 80, and it's about a quarter of a dB on, on 40. That's a 3 to 1 SWR. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that because there are other types of coax. So on page 1.3 of the same book, he has this chart. You'll find this chart in every issue of the AR, ARRL handbook. And basically what you do, you take your coax RG58, look up its loss for 100 dB, not 100 dB, 100 feet on the frequency you want to use it on. Let's say it's 2 dB, and you say you have an SWR of 3 to 1, so you just go, you go up the 2 dB line to get 3 to 1, and then you go across the left, and you say I've got 0.8 dB. You know? And so that's how you can see the loss with... Um, it's the match loss plus the, it's a total loss, basically. It's the SWR loss plus the, uh, no, wait a minute, excuse me. This is the additional loss, I've, excuse me. So you would have 2 dB in the coax in general plus 0 0.8, so it's 2.8 dB, sorry. Also, interesting, in the every ARL handbook, they've got a page where they talk about several myths about SWR. And one of them tells you, you know, with a, a standing wave ratio of up to six to one with good coax and in most reasonable links we use as you know city links nobody on the planet can hear the difference between that and a perfectly matched uh, antenna and if you follow this link on the that page you can read the entire thing and as i say i tell you how to look it up in any handbook so people highly overrate the loss that they're going to get an SWR. And they think if they have two to one SWR, they're they're losing half their power and it, you know, it's just not true. Okay, so now we'll continue with how we add bands. And it's very simple. So this is 40 meters. If we look at the same wire, we, we transmit on 40 meters. It's now a full wavelength. So we have one complete cycle, a positive and a negative half cycle. 80 meters had maximum current here. 40 meters has two maximum currents. Each, each half cycle has a maximum at its peak. And the good news is, uh, you know, the magnitude, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't matter. The radiation intensity is equal. So to get a better view of what's going on, I'm going to look at the absolute value of all of these sine waves for this and all other bands. We'll just flip it upside down, the, the half wave. I blew it up a little bit bigger. So here you can see the two half cycles and notice that they intersect at two points. 
33.333% from one end and then 66.666 from the other. But in the other way around it's 33, et cetera. So one, one third the way in from either end, we have a point of intersection. Now, this was determined, gosh, in this, in the 60s by K4ABT. Uh, he's silent key now, of course, but uh, to my knowledge, he was the first person ever to feed an OCFD or to feed the, feed the old Wyndham with coax. And he built an ugly ballon with uh, nine turns of RG11 on eight inch, or it was eight turns on, on a nine inch core, but it just coax wound as an air core. And, but later he did a lot of measurements and he said for an OCFD antenna, fed at one third if it's lower height let's say 30 to 40 feet so typical city heights it's more like 230 ohms as 90 to 100 feet it's around 280 285 something like that and so i'd say you know most of the time we're, we're down in that area but that's only for these feed points if you move the feed point it changes let's look at the next band when i bring in 20 meters we're going to find four half cycles Two of them cross at the exact same points. Well, you know, when they're crossing at the same point, the current is equal, the impedance is equal. So if we feed it there, whatever the impedance is, it's going to be the same on all bands. And that's great. Sounds great. But it doesn't have to be exactly the same. It needs to be close. Let's bring in 10 meters. I, I left 15 meters out. Bring in 10 meters. It's in green. It's difficult to see. However, notice it crosses at the exact same point again. Now, all of these curves, I drew these manually in PowerPoint. Um, I, later, I, I learned to do this, and I'll show you that with a software, a special program for this. But uh, this was all, I did all of this 12 years ago. I've redone it since then, um, did it all in black, black and white back then. So this is pretty cool. Everything's crossing at the same point. We feed it here. Feed it with a ballon, and we've got 80, 40, 20, and 10 meters. Yeah. What happens when we bring in 15 meters? And as you recall, I said earlier, 15 doesn't work, and you know, we're going to see why. It's going to be obvious why it doesn't work. When I bring in 15 meters, I'm going to I'm going to leave off 10 meters. Just keep in mind it it passes through the same points. But the the graph would be too busy if I showed it. So. The dark black is 15 meters, so we have six peaks. If we look at our two points of intersection, the other bands all cross there. At that point, 15 meters crosses the zero axis. And of course, the formula for resistance or impedance, Z is equal E over I. If you divide by zero, you get infinity. Not really infinity, but you know, it can be really, really high. You know, so you've got very, very high SWR there, and then you will real high SWR, like 20 to 131, you do get a lot of loss in your coax. Yeah, so this is the reason that 15 meters doesn't work. Now, one of the guys, the guy who sells these bad balance, and he's got, a, he's got a real reputable company, but we had a little bit of an argument recently, and he said the OCFD antenna was designed to work only on, on even harmonics. <laughs> Total, utter nonsense. I mean, ridiculous. It has nothing to do with even or odd harmonics. Very simple mathematic. 3.5 megahertz for the 80 meters times 2 is 7. Times 4 is 14. And times 6 is 21. And 21 is the sixth harmonic, and that's an even harmonic. It's not an odd harmonic. So it has nothing at all to do with that. It has everything to do with just how the current is flowing at that point. And if you got current way down low, then you're going to have really high impedance and high SWR. All of this is still theory. It varies a little bit in practice. And that's why there's so much technology in this, because we go through all of these things so you can see exactly why the antenna behaves like it does. So far, we've only looked at the uh, normal, the classic bands. Let's take a look at the walk bands. Before we do, I will remind you that till now we were looking at a point 33% where all the impedances were going to be equal. Well, at this point, I'm going to say, let's change your goal. Our antennas don't have to have one-to-one -one SWR. You know, I mean, most transceivers, a lot of transceivers, good transceivers will work with three-to-one SWR even without a matchbox, but most of them nowadays have a matchbox and three-to-one certainly isn't enough to be detrimental to the signal. 
You might have to turn on your tuner. So if we accept three to one, this would give us a range compared to 50, meter, 50 ohms between 17 ohms and 150 ohms. But we're going through a four to one ballon, which means you know four times 17 and four times 150. So we've got a range between 68 ohms and 600 ohms. Now, let's see if, this, if you can see that. Yeah, that's a really broad range that we can be in. And if we can get our curve passing anywhere through that range, it's going to be less than three to one. It's going to be a usable antenna. So what I did was I started looking for a place along here where all of the curves were somewhere up close to being uh, the same. Didn't have to be exactly the same. I identified two ranges. One of them was at 20%. And the other one was at about 30, it was 29.5 or so. I did all of this in PowerPoint. It didn't even, I didn't use a computer program. Later, I used computer programs. But at the time, I was in a hurry. I wanted to get an antenna up for CQ Worldwide DX. So uh, I identified these two points. Which one do you use? Well, the bottom line, if you're a contester, it makes no difference. They both work. What changes, though, are the warp bands. So if we look at how 30 meters flows, 30 meters is nice and high at point C, 20%, but it's it's not quite zero. It's a little bit, but it's very low at point D. So if you want to work 30 meters and the other bands, uh, excuse me, the other classic bands, you are going to be looking to the 20%. Unfortunately, this 20% has 30 meters, but it does not have 17 meters. 17 minutes and this just got too difficult to do in powerpoint but i'll show you how you can see this in just a second so we've got these two points c and d d has 17 meters but no 30 meters and vice versa so you can't always get what you want i guess most of you recall who's saying that and it's a compromise the good news is so if you take either one of these antennas and take the band that supposedly doesn't work and you use an antenna tuner with it, you can still work a lot of DX with it. It does work. And it's uh, you're going to find out in a minute, it's not actually as bad as it is. There's some other things skewing the curve, and we're going to learn exactly what it is. So the, cur the current is actually a bit higher here than showing here. But it is a compromise. So 23 years ago, there was a, a, a German ham, DL1VU, and he wrote a book. In German, it's called Windem und Strom Summon Antenna, which translated means Windem and Current Sum Antenna. Where's my camera? And let's see if I can find me. Eh, I've got a problem. Abracadabra, how to make the book appear. Well, bear with me one second. So change cameras. That must be my background. So this was his little book. That's not going to work. Excuse me. Anyway, in that book, it was all about Wyndham. It was the old single wire Wyndham, but then about the coax fed Wyndhams, and you could learn all about the, the history of the Wyndhams and so forth. We'll go back on the other camera. But he also had a nice program in there for, for predicting where to feed it. Trouble was, it was in DOS. And, you know... He, Typing in manually 100 lines of code in DOS, I figured I would never manage without mistakes. I just didn't bother. So I just, you know, I used I used my own method here, and I, I got a, some results that work. Luckily, 10 years later, another guy, uh, Klaus uh, DG0KW, he rewrote the software, he ported it to Windows, and made a download available. Uh, it's fr it's free for anyone that wants to use it privately. So I've got a link here. If you go to my web page here, you can download the software. You can download the, the user manual. That's the good news. The bad news is it's all in German. And then if I can get, there we go. The good news is, though, I, I have translated the user manual from German to English. And that's posted on my website. You can download it there. It's pretty easy to use the software once you understand what you have to do. Oh, Nick, I think we've got that echo again. Uh, hello, Nick. Oh, I don't hear you, Nick. Turn on your no, mic. No, that's okay. No, I can't. Someone's, okay. someone's audio popped up. Oh, okay. Okay, great. So 
I've written the manual into English or translated it to English. And then you enter the data, like what bands you want and so forth. And, you know, what's the thickness of your wire and et cetera. You enter that into a template. The, the uh, slots are all labeled in, in German and I've, I've translated it into English. So if you print out my template with the English translations, it's very easy to see, you know, what you have to enter in each of the slots. And after you've done it two or three times, you won't even need to look at it anymore. You know exactly what to do. So, and you can download all of this on my website, follow the link here. That, that link takes you to, as I said, information page for slide 28. But this link here, and, and there you'll find a repeat of this link. So either one will get you straight to that modeling software. Of course, there's other software, EasyNIC, which uh, most people work with. A few months after I built my antenna, a friend of mine, uh, modeled it it's dj 180 and he came up with this first glance that looks outstanding 80 40 20 30 20 15 12 10 i mean what more do you want actually it's not quite as good as it looks because what you don't see is the exact frequency and it turns out 30 meter band is slightly to the left here okay so this was measured on my end to the first one I built. I mean, the first year I measured it with my uh, uh, MFG 259B. So I took about 100 data points and I, I drew the charts manually. It was ugly. The second year I, I splurged and I bought a, a scanning analyzer, a Rig Expert AA54, and that made things a lot simpler. You could really see the curves. Here you can kind of see 80 meters was a bit low on the band and 30 meters the peak is above the band. 20 meters wasn't bad. 15 wasn't bad. 12 peak below it, but it's still quite low. And all of these are below two to one. And I ran CQ Worldwide DX contest barefoot with the transceiver with no tuner or with my amplifier with no tuner. No problem. Switch bands, no problem. Problem was 17 meters. 30, you might have needed an antenna tuner, but it's not a contest band. So how do we know where to feed the antenna? Well, as I said, there's antenna modeling software. And in my opinion, there's no need to model the software. I generally, I've never modeled with NEC. I use that other software, but I see no need to model it because every man and his dog has already done it. And John Young, gosh, 15 years ago, or well, maybe 12 years ago, a long time ago, he modeled it, made models for 160 meters, 80 meters, 40 meters at a couple of different heights. Basically, he modeled to the cows came home. He came up with an Excel spreadsheet, published all of his data into a spreadsheet. There's about 6,000 data points in here. As he modeled it for each band, you know, all of the, we've about eight bands or something like that. And then he modeled it for 50 ohm feed point, 100 ohms, 150, 200, and 300 ohms. And, you know, you take that many different, and then he modeled it in half percentage increments, you know, at the end, at zero, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, not exactly, uh, you know, even numbers, but every half percentage, he had another model. So we, we come up with about 6,000, and you can see absolutely nothing on that. But having been in marketing and, you know, business management, I learned to work with Excel, and it's got a nice feature called Hide. It took me about 10 or 12 hours to go through it. Everything was 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 150 ohms, I hid. I only looked at 200 and 300 ohms. And then I went through on one of the charts, he shows like every 100 kilohertz on the band. So, you know, I blocked most of that out too. And I just looked at it briefly and I said, wait, there's no point in looking at 300 ohms. It's, it's not better anywhere. So I got rid of all the 300 ohms. And I finally came up with a, a nice little chart like the one on the right. You know, nice overview had all of you know my short list of what I might want to use for 80 meters. And here it's very clear to see exactly where you want to go after you blow it up. And so when you blow it up, you can start looking at how it is across the bands. And basically the contest bands interest me, but I didn't want to have it too far off on the uh the, the warp bands. As I said earlier, there's two points. This is down around where I had point C, and this is up around where I had point D. So I said, okay, let's let's focus, let's hone in on these two places. So I brought those in. 
And I just put in some of the bands here because I want to show you probably the most important thing to learn about tuning the OCFD antenna. And that is, if we look at 20 meters and 15 meters, we're going to see why we tune OCFD antennas by observing these two bands, not by looking at 80 or 40. We look at these two bands, okay? And what you see is if we move the feed point closer to the end, 20 meters gets better, 15 meters gets worse. Okay, 12 meters gets better too. We go the other direction, vice versa, 15 better and these two get worse. If we move up to the other range, it's still the same scenario, but it's opposite. Closer to the lower number, 20 and, and, and 12 get worse, 15 gets better and vice versa. So which feed point is best? And the, there's no right answer. It all depends on what you want, you know? And if you're an SSB operator only or a CW operator only, you might want to be 0.12 or 3% different from, from these. And, you know, like I said, he only did about every half percentage point. So uh, I actually ended up through my field work at 29.7. So that's where I put mine. But uh, you, you basically pick something here. You build the antenna. And like always, you leave the ends a little bit longer. You fold the wire back and you go to the field and you start measuring. Now, once again, here's the link to all of these, to these tables, to the original tables, to the files. You can download the, the EXO files at that link. If any of you are in any of the antenna groups, and I know some of you are, I recognize your call sign. You've probably seen this dozens of times. This is what, for some reason, all of the guys like to do. They build an antenna and they show this lousy graph because you can't see any detail, you know. First of all, this first one I took with a, uh, okay, this was with my new analyzer. The first time I did it, the analyzer only measured 100 data points. So if you scan 30 megahertz, your data points, your measurements are far, far off and it just interpolates in between. So it's going to be off quite a lot. This one was fairly accurate because it measured every 60 kilohertz. But the problem is you can't really see much on the bands on these little things here. So that's why I say this graph is worthless. Other than it, I always do it. I always measure this. It's just a quick look to see is the antenna working or not. Because a couple of times I, I did the scan and the graph was up here at 10 to 1 and it went straight line all the way across. And I had a, a bad solder connection and a coax connector, you know. So it's 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 a quick sanity check, but it tells you basically nothing. So if you want to know how your antenna is working, you have to really look each band, look at each band one at a time. So I, I use 250 data points here, which gives me a, a measurement every four kilohertz. The 807HD is is my, well, I say my design, Spiderbeam sells it. They sell different versions of it. This happens to be the U.S. version, so it's, you know, the uh, minimum SWR, I almost said resonance, minimum SWR is up around 3,800. We have another one for general hams and technician hams. It's resonant up around 3,900. So the uh, next, not resonant, minimum SWR. So the dip is moving up here. We also have, um, we can put the dip in the digi band or the CW band, you know, well, actually the, the same down around 35, down around here, have the minimum SWR. 40 meters is the same, or the, the other bands are the same. The, the What we do to move this does not affect the other bands. And we'll see how to do this towards the end of this presentation. And we'll learn how to build it yourself in the next presentation. So here you can see in 40 meters across the whole band, even up into the U.S. band, below 2.2 to 1. If we look at 20 and 15 meters, we're below. This one goes a little bit higher here. You could... Uh, let me come back to that. When I went to, to uh, 10 meters, I had to increase the scan to 3 megahertz because, uh, you know, it's a wider band. What I want to focus on is 15 and 20 meters. Here you see 20 meters. It's it's worst SWR is on the high end of the band. And on 15, the worst is on the low end of the band. So if we were to make the antenna longer, then that would bring 15 meters in a little bit better, but it would make 20 meters even worse. And if we made it shorter, vice versa. And that's why I say we have to tune our, our trim, prune our antenna by watching these two bands. And it's every case, regardless of where I put the feed point, it was always this case. And by the way, if you're moving 
the feed point inch by inch, you also find these two move in opposite directions. So forget about wondering where to set your antenna on 80 meters. You set it somewhere low below the band. I'll show you, you know, where I recommend setting it, leaving extra wire, but you tune by watching these two bands. Now we're going to come to a fun part, and I'm going to debunk the myth that the OCFD is a, is a harmonic antenna because it's not, but it almost is. Let's say you work SSB on 80 meters. So here in Europe, we want to put it at 3,700. Well, the second harmonic is, is you know, 7.4, 14.8, 22. All of these are outside the band. And for the states, we put it at 3,800. We're way outside the band. If we, if we put our, you know, SWR minimum for CW and Digi, Digi down around 3,550, we get it inside the band. So, you know, you, you can't make your antenna resonant, excuse me, minimum SWR inside the 80 meter band and expect to have low SWR inside the higher harmonic bands. It's just not gonna work. And by the way, this is only half the story, it gets worse. Now this is this is the fun part. So let's say you're, if you look at my picture on your screen, and me, not the, you'll see I'm out here in outer space, and I've flown out here, so I could I could examine this antenna. This is an 80 meter dipole in outer space in free space. It's exactly half wavelength long, two quarter wavelength. So we have one half wavelength end to end, and uh, knowing how that works really doesn't help us much because I don't know anybody that builds antennas in outer space. I know a couple of guys that want to try it. They're they're looking to uh, to move to outer space. So one of them is Elon Musk. The other is Richard Branson. But until they get out there, there's no sense in looking at that. So I'd, I'd like to have uh, Scotty beam me back down, down here on Earth where you guys are at. And let's take a look now. Let me clear this out. Add how our antennas work here on Earth. Here on Earth, we find we have two things that affect the length that we need to cut our dipole to. The first one, velocity factor, is pretty clear. Wire has typically a velocity factor about 0 0.98. So we shorten the wire by 2% so that, uh, you know, because of the velocity factor. So it only needs to be 98% as long as a, as a physical wavelength. Obviously, uh, these are blown, these are exaggerated, so you can see the difference. It's absolutely not to scale. But the second thing is end effect. When we have a wire on an antenna, unterminated, over ground, we have something called end effect. Now, this will generally cause us to have to shorten the antenna by 4 or 5%. Okay, so we end up with having the antenna, really, the wire really only being 93% of a quarter wavelength in each half. That's on 80 meters, but we wanna work 40, 20, 15, and 10. Let's see what happens on 40. On 40 meters, we'll find we have four quarter wavelengths. The outer quarter wavelengths, they're shortened by end effect and by velocity factor, but the inner quarter wavelengths, they have no end effect. They only have the velocity factor, so they need to be 98%. You know, so we're, we're too short. The antenna is too short. The antenna needs to be lengthened longer than it is. Here's what, how long it is. It needs to be this long if we want it to work on, it, on 40 meters. But if we cut it this long, then it's resonant. Excuse me. Minimum SWR on 80 meters is going to be below the band. The next thing I'd like to do is look at all of the bands. Well, not all of them. I left out the walk bands. But let's look at these harmonic bands. It's a little bit complicated. We'll go through it step by step. Red is what we have if we just built an 80 meter resonant dipole. If we look at it at 40 meters, this is the same thing we looked at on the previous page. We've got the two inner quarter wavelengths too short. On 20 meters, we've got eight quarter wavelengths and six of them are too short. Down here in blue, this is what we need. You know, and we looked at this. This is the same as on the previous page. It needs to be a little bit longer. But on 20 meters with, with six of them too short, it has to be even longer. 
And on 15 meters, we've got, I don't know how many of them, eight of them probably or whatever. <laughs> anyway, the, the higher we go, the farther apart these go. Now I'm gonna show you real live antennas and measurements I've done that will you know, show you that this is actually what's happening, but this is why it's happening. So we've not only got the fact that, that you know, if we tune somewhere down in the low end, or, but inside the band on 80, we're outside the band. We also have got this end effect problem that makes us even worse outside the band, which tells me we have to make the antenna on 80 meters even longer. As you see, it's not a harmonic band. Now this is real life. This is no longer just theory. The first thing I've done is I just put in straight factors for harmonics. 3.5, 7, 14, 21, 28. So, you know, it's 200%, 400%, 600%, 800%. Now let's look at real live antennas. I've got two, it's actually the same antenna. All I did was move the feed, the, uh, you know, the, the ballon, same ballon, same antenna, I moved the feed point. 33.3% is a classical or classic uh, OCFD antenna. 29.7 is my favorite. For some reason, I had a shift of 10 kilohertz for the frequency of minimum SWR. Not going to worry about that. If I measure the same antenna on two different days, there can be five kilohertz anyway. So that really isn't a problem. Here's what I saw. When I go to the second harmonic, this one was 202% of that number. This was 204. This is 410, 407, 612, 615, 824, 827. So this percentage continues to get larger and larger. So the, the, the minimum SWR keeps wandering higher and higher in the band. That's why we really have to cut the 80 meters pretty far below the band in order uh, for it to work on the higher bands. <laughs> You wonder, this is like a never-ending story, huh? but it gets even worse. There's one more, but one last thing that we have to be aware, be aware of and beware of. And we've already looked at this earlier, but I'm going to show you how much difference it can really make. Common mode current causes SWR to skew higher up the band. And the question might be how much. First thing I did was build an 80-meter dipole. I put a one-to-one -one current ballon, choke ballon in the center of it. I calculated with the dipole formula to be 3480, measured it, came out to be 3450. I wanted it below the band, and I didn't know how far to go, but I, I, I thought 3480 might be enough, and I, I put it to 3480, and it turned out to be 3450. I learned later with this antenna why that is. When I built this antenna, it was the first time I used the really thin wire. It was uh, AWG, American Wire Gauge 26. Very thin wire, about a half millimeter diameter. I'd always built with number 18 in the past, which is what Spider Beam uses in their Yagis. Guess why I built with that wire? Got it for free. Um, so as it turns out, the thinner wire, it's got a, a lower velocity factor than a thicker wire. So much so that if I cut the antennas to be minimum SWR in the same frequency, the thick wire was 40 centimeters longer. What's that in inches? Uh, 2.5, 20 inches or something. No, not that, whatever it is in inches. But anyway, it's quite long. 40 centimeters longer for thick wire than for thin wire. And that, that's why I came out so low here. I just left it because I really wasn't interested in building a dipole to use. I was interested in finding out how the balance compared to each other. So keep this figure in mind. This is the target we're going to be looking for. We need to be near that at least. Here, 29.7% split. G3 TXQ, of course, silent key now. Um, at the time I did this, he was not. Um, he's got this web page, one of many web pages, where he actually shows a lot of different one-to-one -one chokes and tells how much common mode impedance they have. And I'll use his charts to define these. This is a ballon relative expensive, outstanding quality, but no good for an OCFD antenna. It would work in a loop, but not in these antennas. It's because he used number 52 toroid, low, relative low, 250 permeability, and he only used 11 turns. And it's a four to one guanella. So you have paralleled coils. So you end up with only 
500 ohms and 500 ohms is nothing. And look where minimum SWR landed over 400 kilohertz higher than it should be. I said, okay, not to worry, we'll build our own. So I made one myself and I used number 43. It has 800 permeability and I managed to get 17 turns onto the cores, to the two cores, which gives me 4,000 ohms. 3515, well, I'm not where I need to be, but it's certainly a lot closer. I wanna come back to this in a second, show you what happened when I added a choke. So then I, I had discussed this with, with Steve, uh, G3TXQ, and learned that I just couldn't get enough common mode impedance with a dual core four to one. I had to go to a one to one. One of the things I had done, I tried using a one to one. This is the FT24043, a one to one choke ballon. I first put in a dual core here, worked, but I thought, heck, I don't need the dual core. I don't need any common mode impedance. So I switched to a one to one rough rough a voltage balance, excuse me, not one-to-one, four-to-one, Rutherf balance. So it's it's a combination of two balance. I call it a hybrid balance. It's called that in ham circles, but the, the uh, commercial engineers, they like to call it a compound balance. It's not a new idea, but it wasn't very well known in the ham circles. So I built this. It has about 8,000 ohms, the first one, which was using the two of these FT240 cores. I came out to 3440. There's even 10 kilohertz below here. Of course, part of the difference might have been the weather the day I measure or something, but basically that's ballpark. Okay. I repeated the same thing with smaller cores with the FT140s and with the FT114s, keeping the same number of turns count. This isn't really eight kilo ohms. It reduces a little bit, and Steve didn't measure these. So I, I have no idea, and I didn't bother to measure them. I was interested in the results because the results kept coming in at 3450. So, you know, my tiny little balance were blowing the socks off of this expensive thing up here. You know, this probably, these probably cost me 20 pounds to build or something like that, uh, as opposed to about a hundred pounds to buy the one up there. And the difference is mine work and that one does not. Okay. So this is what is confusing about all of this. And especially in the States, there's a lot of balance vendors, excuse me, OCFD antenna vendors, and they're building their OCFDs and using this ballon on the top or one like it. Their 80 meters SWR is resonant inside the band and it looks great, you know. But if you're resonant inside the band and you're also resonant on your, you know, 40, 20, 15, 10 meters inside the bands, you've got an awful lot of common mode current on your coax and you don't want that, you know. So you must put not resonance, minimum SWR below the band. I went back up to each of these antennas and I took, let me get it again. And I'm going to switch to the, uh, if I do this, you'll see it a lot better. There's somewhere around here, there's none. Here you can see it a lot better. This is a, basically a Maxwell choke balance. So I just added this Maxwell choke. And while I'm here, I can show you some of these others. This is the FT240 core. That's a 1-to-1 one Guanella. It's actually the same one, identical one that I used in the, in the big ballon of my hybrid. This is my little one, my tiny little one. Let me put it up and compare them. This, this is what we use in the 807. And like I say, I've got a lot of customers that run a kilowatt SSB through this thing. Never had anybody burn one up. I did have twice complaints in FT8. The ballon will get warm and you start to get SWR creep already at 200 watts. So I worked with one of my customers in the States and a good friend of mine over there. And I had him rebuild the top one. I had him take this apart and stack two of these cores together and rewind it. And when he did that, he was able to get 600 watts through it before he got S SWR creep. So as you can see, it really doesn't have anything to do with the size of the ballon. It has a little bit to do with the size of the ballon, but it has a lot more to do with the design of the ballon, what material you use, basically know-how. And apparently most of the people building these antennas don't have the, the right know-how. So let me just, I think I can click that out. And get back into my comfort zone. Where am I over here? Okay, so 
as I say, I, I put this one Maxwell choke on the my dual core four to one. This dropped to 3480. It's about 30 kilohertz above where it should actually be, should be at 3450. So I said, hey, you know, that's close enough for government work. There's a little bit residual common mode current on it, not enough to worry about. I'm sure it would be good to go with that. But on the other hand, I see no reason to use the dual core. I, I can tell you, so I will tell you more about this in the next presentation because it's shorter than this presentation. So I then went up and I put the choke on this one, on the, this poor balance. And it dropped from 3890 down to around, you know, 3700 or something like that. I then put a second one on it. It dropped around, to, you know, 3550. Or I don't remember exactly where, but, you know, I kept adding these chokes. It kept getting better. So then, but I didn't, I only had two. So then I, I took this choke. I hope you can see it, but you, you saw this earlier. You know, it always goes backwards, doesn't it? That was the little one, the one-to-one. -one. And I put that onto it, and then it dropped to 35, uh, excuse me, 3450. So it's very obvious the cause here is insufficient common mode impedance. And that's what's wrong with about 90% of the OCFDs that were ever built in the history of the antenna. And I don't know why it took so long for people to discover that. It, you know, maybe because I put five years into finding out. Okay, so let's... A warning for people that have built their own or bought one. If you have bought or built an 80 meter OCFD antenna with SWR minimum inside the harmonic bands, which is good, but it's also inside the 80 meter band, you've got a lot of common mode current, significant common mode current on your feed line. And that's, that's bad. So, and if you do have uh, your resonance or your SWR minimum too low, very simple. Very simple solution, how to fix it. I'm going to show you in the next slide. We're going to build one in the, the next presentation. It's through a capacitor. And if you've got common mode current issues, well, you know, the problems of balance. So use a good quality four to one balance for the impedance transformation and use a choke. Choke that OCFD. Okay, so this is how we fix it. Here's our OCFD, not to scale, just any OCFD. We're going to cut it, the overall length right in half, put an insulator in it. We're going to insert a capacitor across the insulator to connect the two wires back. We have to put a bleeder resistor across it. Otherwise, static electricity in a, in a decent thunderstorm will kill the capacitor. The first ones I built look like this. I just took a, a tiny little piece that was about, I don't know, half an inch by two inches, drilled three holes weave the wires in and out, and then soldered resistors and capacitors. I say uh, capacitors and a resistor. I had one single three watt resistor, but I had you know several capacitors. Show you why you need several capacitors and not just one. I mean, you could use a big doorknob, but you know how do you know what value you need? And the advantage of combining lots of little capacitors is you can kind of prune the frequency where you want it. So the capacitor raises the resonant frequency as well as SWR minimum on the 80 meter band with no significant change to the higher bands. The value of the capacitor determines the desired resonant frequency. So by varying the capacitance, you can change where resonant frequency again, huh? It does change resonant frequency, but we're more interested in SWR minimum. And spider beam, like I said, they sell these with uh, four different versions. All they're doing is putting this piece, they're changing it in and out. They're actually swappable in the antenna. And so uh, what I do is for contest, I'll put in the CW uh, cap board. And for SSB, I put in the SSB cap board. And then I don't have to use a tuner. So larger capacitance. And this this actually went opposite as, as I was thinking. But you know, I guess I didn't know what I was doing. A larger capacitance lowers the frequency. A smaller capacitance raises the frequency. And in part two, I'll give you ballpark numbers to start with and show you how you can tune it. Here's the next thing that kind of bugs people. We're used to, you know, if we have a fan dipole, we tune every band independently, but OCFDs don't work like that. You know, if you make it longer or shorter, it changes all bands at once. So, you know, it's, it's an interactive between bands. You can't adjust individual bands without affecting the others. 
when you make length adjustments, higher bands are affected much more so than lower bands. If we trim it a bit, make it higher, 10 kilohertz on 80, it's 20 kilohertz on 40, 40 kilohertz on 20, 60 kilohertz on 15, and uh, 80 kilohertz on 10. We only move 10 kilohertz down here. So, you know, you do have to take care of what you're doing. And always check the SW on all bands after making adjustments. The OCFD is a great multi-band antenna as long as you are willing to compromise a little on SWR. Better to optimize on the high bands because, you know, on the low bands, uh, the SWR, the, the loss in the coax isn't as high on low bands. So, you know, just I always pay attention to the high bands. Now, what works good does not mean it or excuse me, what works does not mean it works good. In the antenna groups that we're in, we've always got people logging in and telling us how great their antenna work, and they listed three QSOs that they had. Well, Tom Schiller, N6BT, he was the founder of Force 12 Antennas. He put out, a, he published a really funny, interesting document or uh, article in QST long ago. Uh, I've got links to it, though. Everything works. And what he did, he took a light bulb. He took a you know a 150 watt incandescent Thomas Edison light bulb, and he mounted it on a wooden fence post six feet high, and he put immediately an RF choke attached to it, and then ran coax. And then he ran um, some I don't remember which which contest he ran, but he he ran one of the DX contests, 100 watts, and on a single single weekend he worked all seven continents on a light bulb six meters off the ground so everything works so you know when somebody tells me they work something so what i mean if i win a contest and that's meaningful now this is my favorite slide that was my favorite car because that was my first car not got it in 1964 when i got my driver's license if you notice from the picture i was a bit thicker back then i've lost weight the interesting thing why i'm showing this one year before that, I built my first Wyndham, and if, you know, a few years later, I, I built a OC, real OCFD antenna. You know, but I was building them, kind of like these Morris miners were built. Now I was living in Oklahoma. As far as I know, I had the only Morris miner in Oklahoma, but for me, that was the best car in the world. Today, you know, you can see car technology has, has advanced. This is the car I have today, in my dreams. You know, I've never even seen one on the road, but, uh, you know, some OCFD antennas are more efficient than others and free of common mode current if you build them right. And the difference between these lousy antennas back then and, the, you know, to the, the good antennas, they may not be as dramatic as what we see between these two cars, but boy, it, it's huge. And it's, it's a big advantage if you build it right. So this brings us to the finally working good and, and, and working bad or what works good. For me, working good means this. You know, I want all of my radiation coming out of the radiator. That's desired radiation. I'm going to chase the X and work all states and work contests and all zones and all that. Here's what I don't want. I don't want to chase these two. I don't know if any of you guys have, have earned these awards yet. This is worked all smoke detectors and this is worked all televisions. So this is undesired radiation, and the last thing we want is radiation from a coax. Even though there's people that claim it's good, uh, that might have been good 60 years ago, but with wall-to-wall -wall consumer devices in our houses, we do not want this. Summary, probably the last slide. The OCFD antenna can be a wonderful, efficient multiband antenna if you build it right. No such thing as a best feed point. You're always hearing people claiming they've got the best. There's no such thing. It's horses for courses. The ballon is the key to success. If you get your ballon right, you're halfway home. A single core four to one ballon just simply does not work and do not use it. And a dual core four to one ballon is probably not the best idea. There's another reason. I'll explain that next time. There's another reason it's not a good idea to use these hybrid ballons or compound ballons. That's the way to go. But you have to build it yourself because there are a couple being sold uh, on the commercial market. I know of two companies selling them. Uh, they both will work sometimes, and one of them will fail quite a lot, and the other one fails under certain circumstances. The second one's pretty good all the time, except in digi modes. So the I went through two. The OCFD must have SWR well below the fundamental band. Tune trim the length to optimize SWR across 15 and 20 meters. 
Raise SJBR minimum on the fundamental band with capacitor. Beware of vendors selling snake oils because there are plenty of them out there, especially on eBay. To be sure, I recommend you do it yourself, and we're going to learn how to do that in part two of my presentation. So this basically concludes it. I'd like to just point out down here, once again, here's the link in your PDF. This should take you straight to the page. Otherwise, go to dj0ip.com and look for HH2G presentation, you know, and you'll find it in there. I've got several email addresses, and the one some of you may know me under, Rick at DJ0IP, do not use it because I get 50 to 100 emails there every day. Sometimes emails get lost or they stay in there for a week. Please send questions to this. Yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide to OCFD, so dash OCFD at aerial51.com. And I that they'll be only questions about this antenna. And the three websites I have, I didn't want three, I wanted two. I wanted this one and this one. Ran out of space on this one, so I had to buy another one. Uh, so I've ended up having three. So my information can't be found on a single web page. It's spread across three. So I'd like to open it up for questions. And Nick, I think I'd say before we do, let's take a two or three minute break. Everybody can, you know, go to the bathroom or get a coffee or whatever, get a stretch, and then we'll open it up for questions. Nick, is that all right? Absolutely brilliant, Rick. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, right, should we take a uh, just a couple of minute break uh, uh, to either go to Lou or go and grab a drink and then come back for any questions to Rick? Yeah, thank you, Rick. Well, uh, just a, a couple of points. Uh, if people haven't spotted, I put into the chat uh, the two documents that um, uh, Rick was talking about. One was the handout with all the links on all the web pages. That's the first one. And the second document I put in uh, was the article that appeared in RAGCOM in December uh, 2017 by M0RZF Rob, who I've been in contact with. And incidentally, um, for those people up here in Yorkshire, um, that, uh, that antenna in RAGCOM was used by G3UNA at the Knaresborough Amateur Radio Club uh, as a club project to, to build a version of it. And G3UNA is also written on that. Uh, subjects as well but they're, they're the two bits that i've copied into the uh into the chat and you can download the documents directly from the chat and have a look at them in your own time Okay, Rick, and okay, everybody else. Um, uh, that was some presentation, Rick. I have to say, it, there was, uh, as you know, and you and I know, because we've been talking about this for some time now, um, an awful lot of information in that uh, first part of the presentation. Uh, and this is really the taster to the second part of the presentation, which is coming up next month, which is more going to be about putting this into practice. So the practical side of building the antenna and building the ballon. And they're the two things that Rick's going to uh, talk about in a lot more information and detail in part two. So has anyone got any questions to Rick um, from tonight's presentation? <clears throat> or has this just been too much for everybody? <laughs> Anyone got anyone got any questions? Very well, quiet. Looks like I got everybody put to sleep. But you know, <laughs> I, I told you before the questions will come once we learn how to build the thing because I think that there you can get into quite a lot of questions. But we've, uh, we've, this was the theory. We've, we've got one here, Rick uh, M zero KIL. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, excellent talk. That's. Uh, uh, reinforced one to my prejudices, but uh, <laughs> um, I have a, a question basically regarding the placement of the, the ferrite. Uh, because of the weight of the ferrite, um, obviously the, the, the area was going to sag quite a bit. 
Um, and with the easy availability of 300 ohm um, ladder line, is an option to have a, a 300 ohm version with the ferrite on the ground? Let's see. Okay, yeah, my mic's on. Yeah, there is, and it's a lousy solution. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> no, no, let me explain. Let me, let me explain. First of all, um, I don't know why it has to be heavy because how much power do you run? As far as I know, you're allowed 400 watts. Um, or how much power? Well, no, you may not want to say how much power you're running. <laughs> <laughs> Let me hold this up again. This thing weighs nothing. I, I, I can pull out a scale and weigh it, but it's you don't even have to put them in a box. Quite a lot of the antennas I build, including some of them I, I, I built for uh, for Emil for the for the Rockwell expedition. I didn't put an enclosure in them. I just built them like this. Uh, what I sometimes do once they're all soldered and all that, I coat it with the. Uh, uh, liquid electrical tape, you know, just painted a few thick coats and that's it. It's just fine. To the contrary, they actually cool better. So like K9AY and his uh, RF choke cookbook book, he recommends not using a ballon enclosure. Just leave it out open because it will cool much better. So but you can build it lighter. Here's what happens when you use uh, 300 ohm. Now I'm not against using 300 ohm, but I'm against using it in an OCFD antenna. If I want to use it, lightweight and 300 ohm and then if you use 300 ohm you're going to have to use a ballon and i'll tell you why in a second uh, ballon you're going to have to use a a um, matchbox and i'll tell you why in a second so the problem with this is you have so much common mode current at the feed point of an off center fed dipole that you absolutely need a ballon at the at the, you need a good choke ballon at the feed point to block the common mode current if you don't have that you're going to have common mode current all the way down your, your feed line. And you can put a ballon down there, but here's what we've experienced in doing that. When you, you cut the antenna, as I'm going to show you how to cut it, you know, similar lengths and all that, and should work, and you put a ballon in, it does work. And then you put 300 ohm, and you drop down to a ballon somewhere else. This changes the antenna, you know, because the feed line actually becomes part of the antenna. And so it's all out of resonance, and, and you most likely will lose a band maybe two bands, you know, and, and it's okay in the field to have antennas with, with uh, common mode current on the, on the coax, but you certainly don't want to have that around a housing area. You know, I mean, I showed you a, a, one of the uh, presentations here earlier, one of the slides, I actually saw as much as 58 watts on the coax with just a hundred watts driving into it. I mean, it's, if you're running high power, you can have an awful lot of radiation out of your feed line. So, you know, I, I would recommend not doing it, but it does work. I mean, you could, if you can get it to resonate, and you can always do that with a matchbox, you're going to work station with it just fine. But, but for reasons of common mode current, I don't recommend doing that. If you decide you want a lightweight antenna, move that to the center of the antenna and run it down and, and match it with, with a, a, a matchbox. You know, that's what I ran for 50 years works just fine so and and some people swear by it some people have done it and they say hey they're getting by but other people have i tried it once too and you know i, I had too much common mode current i said forget it and that's why i designed lightweight balance the problem is try to buy a lightweight balance it's next to impossible you know everybody's selling balance they're saying they're five kilowatts or something they weigh they weigh you know three pounds so do you not have the possibility to place your your uh, ballon at the at a, on a pole or something, or hang it on a tree, or? Oh sure, yeah. Um, it's just I'm thinking in theoretical terms, um, but you know, in, at other times I've used uh, a telescopic pole to uh, you know a fiber class pole to um, support a feed point. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that, that's my right. answer. I mean, it, you can try it, but but uh, don't be surprised if you lose a band <laughs> or if you have trouble with common mode current. Sure. Okay. I, I just make another statement. A lot of guys, lots of <laughs> we, we, we've got this OCFD group, which I could in, I could highly recommend joining. I should have put, I'll put a link onto the um, the, the other pages here, the, the, the web page there. It's on groups io and we've got i don't know 1300 members or something like that a lot of guys have tried that and all the time you have people new new guys come in and they built this thing and their ocft doesn't work one band or another it's just not working and they describe it and for the reasons you just named they just came out of coax 
just straight out of coax and drop down 10 or 20 feet. And they put their ballon there. And I said, move your ballon to the feed point. And so every time I said that, every time they moved the ballon to the feed point and it worked like it should. You know, you, you just don't want to have your ballon away. You want to choke the common mold current before it hits the feed line. Yeah, fine. Hmm. Lovely. Thank you, Keith. And uh, yeah. that, that's a good uh, tip from Rick that I know mm -hmm. he'll talk about again on the second part of the presentation. But um, uh, the point he makes about actually there, there is no need to stick the whole ballon into a box. It's the box that increases the weight of these things, really does. And then particularly if you fill the box as well, yeah, top of the ballon. Well, I will show, except I, I call it an open frame. I didn't know what else to call it. So I call it an open frame ballon. And I'll show uh, examples of what I've used. Uh, there's one company in Germany selling back planes. Uh, it's called DX Wire uh, for open frame. But I've designed... Uh, one that you can build out of i i like i used plexiglass at first but i didn't like working with it because when you drill holes or something that would melt and all the gooey stuff would stick to the drill bit and all that so i switched to fr4 which is epoxy board like they build printed circuit boards with but you can buy that without copper and at various thicknesses and this is outstanding then for back planes for for a, a uh, ballon and so i typically use that when i build um antennas and you know i've probably built well i definitely have built over 100 balance probably 150 something like that yeah i'm just crazy well you know you know uh i'm also crazy about climbing and stuff like that well i'm crazy about balance <laughs> yeah and it may be i mean in that second um that second uh, article um uh by uh by Rob um, that was published in Radcom, and I know you've done some work on that as well, Emil, uh, is uh, the the concept of an end-fed um, off-center-fed dipole as well, which uh, is a, an interesting one that would maybe would solve the issue that Keith was raising anyway. Yeah, uh, depends on how, how he's going to string it. Uh, I mean, I don't know if he wants to string it as a, a flat top, but it would definitely do that, you know, or an inverted V or, or, or how. Um, what I want to say about Rob, he and I, we worked together before he published the article. I actually worked with him on some of the text. And after he built it and published it, and he sent me a, a, a print circuit board to build his ballon. And after he had published it, he decided he liked my ballon better, so he has redone it, reworked it with uh, with my ballon practically. And then he moved QTHs and was able to put up a normal OCFD, so he replaced his EC OCFD with a normal OCFD using my balance. Hmm. So, gibt es noch mal Fragen da aus Deutschland? <laughs> Not really. I'm uh, absolutely flabbergasted. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> What's very interesting, but uh, I, I have to um, uh, let it go down to my heart first. Yeah. <laughs> this, this will take several hours, I, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, well uh, for you, I'm going to talk in English. Uh, for you, I would recommend this book. I can't get the camera to show these things. They, yeah, I have to turn off my... Well, you may be familiar with it. Uh, uh, so Carl Heinz Hiller, D-Lines D VU, yeah, he wrote this book 20 years ago, yeah. and it's yeah. available from Funk Amateur, usually for between three to five euro. And that's where I learned an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But um, the problem was uh, he didn't go far enough. And so I, I, read, I read this book. He talked about more things to do. I recommended earlier when you're researching balance that you read the article from W7EL. And he did a lot of tests for common mode current and so forth. And he ended his 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 uh, article by saying, once he's completed it, he learned so many more things there are still to be tested and tried and all that. So I just went through and I made a list and I put that on my to-do list. I'm going to test and try what he says is left outstanding to do. And of course, um, I didn't feel at all competent enough to do that alone. But uh, I have good friends. In fact, almost all of my friends are good engineers. I was not. I was a, I was a marketing guy. And they're all good engineers. Uh, D.I.N.S. D.J. 1.A.T. Uh, he's 
he wrote the textbook for all the universities on antennas. He's my best friend in life, and uh, he helped me a lot. But as did Steve and, and then GM3, SEK, indirectly. I never had direct contact with him. And, man, these guys really taught me and helped me to do it right. And so including calibrating the instruments before I used them, et cetera. And so then I went through and I started measuring all these things that other guys had said need to be measured. And I came up with results and they're all published on my web. And anybody that wants to dispute them, they're, they're welcome to read the measured data, try it themselves and we'll compare data. But I, I'll guarantee you, you'll read a lot of nonsense in textbooks. I'm sure about that. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, Karl Heinz Hille is uh, he's quite famous. Uh, we've yeah. known a lot of articles of uh, his in uh, CQDL, I think, for example, and other publications as well. He um, was quite famous for his travels, uh, always yeah. taking an arrow uh, and a bow with him to shoot out his uh, antennas from uh, hotel rooms into palms nearby. I know. <laughs> what did he, he published? What two hundred thousand QSOs or something from the Far East? Or yeah, I mean, I followed him well. We I had a lot of nice talks with him too. You know, I mean, he, he's silent key now, but uh, mm. he would always. You know, I worked for Spider Beam for fifteen years. I retired three years ago, so in Friedrichshafen, uh, he would always stop by the uh, the booth, you know, and have a chat with us. Great guy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, will you be at uh, Friedrich uh, uh No, we, we, we like, uh, you know, I would still go if Spider Beam went, but Spider Beam is not going. Vimo is not going. Defona is not going. Kenwood is not going. It's dying. No pity. You know, it's, yeah, so I, I, I really, you know, with Corona, I'm 75 years old, a little bit overweight and all that. It's it's not a great idea to be around thousands of people. You know, it's just, uh, I don't mind the smaller groups. I mean, presenting like this, I've never done it before. It's it's kind of strange because I have dead silence on my yeah. end. Yeah. And I say, you know, ground control to Major Tom, anybody <laughs> out there? <laughs> you know, I can see your pictures, but, uh, you know, it's, it's quite different when you're giving a live presentation where you can see the faces and, and so forth. And sometimes if I saw somebody with a really puzzled look, then I, you know, would, hey, you know, was that not clear? Maybe I should explain it a different way or something. But uh, on the other hand, this is a lot cheaper than flying over to the UK. <laughs> yeah. That's for would, sure. That's I would like sure. to I'd like to fly to the UK, but when there's WPX contest, the prefix contest, because there is not very many G5s of us left anymore. <laughs> now that is true. <laughs> oh, um, G3s. Uh, I only knew, uh, know uh, Peter Waters, I think. Yeah, yeah, and he's getting up there in age too. Yeah. Yeah. We've got our we've got a, a, a Mike. We've got our own G three SDY in the club, of course. So uh. yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but Roger, uh, Roger, you had your hand up. Where's Roger? Oh, hi, yeah. Roger. Uh, hi, Rick. Thanks for that. They're really interesting. Um, yeah, like uh, others have said, there's a lot to digest there. I wonder if you could expand a little on how you measure the common mode current. I think you said a clamp meter, but my clamp meter will measure hertz, kilohertz, maybe, but not into the megahertz. I just wonder how you, how yeah. you get that accuracy. You know, the best way to to do that is to show you, but I'm just, if I, if Nick can help me to turn off my presentation and if I can hit my website, you can see it. And there are the, uh, okay, right, now. The presentation's off. You'll need to go back can, into can I, share your website. Yeah. Let's see if I hit this. I can't. Now, if I disappear, I'll log back in again. I'll dump that. No, leave meeting. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, yeah, here. Down here, I can see it. Let me move this up here and go to... Their screen? Yeah. Bear with me a second. It's coming up. So, CMC. Okay, so I've got that. Now I just have to, you know. well, I've found it on my screen. I've got to get it back up so you guys can see it. You've got so. to hit share screen and then select the one you're looking at, Rick. Yeah, but, but I've lost it again. I've. <laughs> oh, boy. Sorry, guys. 
okay, it's this one. And now, see, I've lost the menu for share screen. So maybe this wasn't such a good idea for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I hit share screen. There it is. Share. Well, I still see the same old one. Oh, no, this one is there. Can you see it? Yes. There we can. Okay. Yeah. So now there's about half a dozen circuits flo floating around where you can build your own real cheap. But, you know, I was in a hurry, and I, I wanted to be sure I had good instruments. So uh, I I bought this. It's actually kind of a half-truth because I convinced Spider-Bean that they needed to buy that for me because I was developing antennas that they might want to sell. And so they bought it for me. And uh, it looks a bit funny here. I've got this little one piece of coax on here. It's about 10 inches long, something like that. The problem with these clamp-on meters is the, the diameter is big enough for RG2, um, what was it, RG11, I think, which is even, even thicker than RG213. And then when you're measuring thinner coax, what I noticed was the reading on the scale would vary because you could push the, uh, the clamp around closer or farther away from the coax, so I was getting different readings. And, you know, you can't use that when you're going to be comparing balance. So I said, okay, I'll take RG213. I wrapped a couple of layers of tape around it so that I had a tight fit of the, the clamp. So then it can't move. And then what I did was I just inserted this every time I wanted to measure somewhere. So I always had the meter clamped exactly with the same uh, um, tight fit, regardless of what ballon I was measuring or what length of coax I was measuring, et cetera. Because otherwise that would uh, it'd be one more variable that, that comes into it. You know, you wouldn't know for sure. And I, the whole idea was not to come up with the best antenna. I, I was trying to understand how common mode current affects OCFD antennas. But I began with the 40 meter dipole. And I, I'm, all the tests I ran on all of the antennas, I also ran on a 40 meter a dipole. And that was my stake in the ground. And once I had that, I could see just how good or how bad of a job the balance were doing. And then I would take sometimes another choke and add it to the balance and see what happened and so forth. And I, I made altogether 1000 measurements and it's actually 500 pairs of measurements because I would measure with an analyzer and with the uh, RFM meter, and then I recorded them in pairs, so you could you could see the amount of current or you know common mode current, but you could also see what it was doing to your antenna. Right, I so that's a um, that's a that's a, 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 a multi-turn whatever uh, clamp yeah. meter. Like, yeah, effectively. inside there, I, I just around, you know, just around I have, the outside of the coax. Excuse me. Yeah, it clamps just, over the coax, yeah. but yeah, yeah. In, inside this. It's basically it's just like a big toroid that's cut in half. There's a number of wires in there, but I, I can't, you know, I haven't looked inside there for, for six years or, or five years, something. So, uh, no, wait, that's been, you know, that's been 10 years. <laughs> I haven't opened it for 10 years. It's just always clamped onto that thing. But there's a number of turns going around there. There are plenty of, um, you know, G3, uh, you, what was it called? TXQ. He has somewhere on his website uh, instructions for building one. GM3 SEK has it, VK1OD has it, um, W8JI has it on his website, you know, and they're all similar. So there's lots of them floating around, you know. They're cheap to build. I think I paid about $100 for this. Um, last time I checked, they weren't, you know, due to Corona, a lot of stuff wasn't uh, available, but uh, they might be available again. But, you know, they had a cheaper one. I had, If I had to do it all over, I would have bought the cheaper one. The advantage of this one is it has two very low scales that are amplified. So it can measure very low uh, current, RF current. It's useless. And the reason it's useless is when you clamp it onto an antenna and you have it on those low scales and you're not applying any power to your, to your antenna, the meter is wiggling all over the place between half scale and full scale and back and forth. There's so much RF floating in the air from who knows what. 
You know, I mean, I don't even live in a city. I live out in the country, but there's, there's just so much RF in the air. And then I have to go to the lowest scale that's not amplified. Well, the cheaper meter can measure down to that level as well. So I may have well have just bought the cheaper meter. They have two of them. Um, Vimo sells them here. I, probably others do too, but I think I got mine from Vimo. So you know, it's like 10 years ago, so I don't remember yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Roger Waters and Stanton sell that um, MFJ RF current meter. About okay, 200, yeah. About 200 pounds they are. Mm. No, no, I, I, will, I, I wasn't interested in buying one. I was just wondering just think how you do it. Because oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't well, remote meter or, your, or whatever will work. I, it, gosh. It, only transformers will be saturated at megahertz you know, rate. I, I could show you quite easily if I were better at using this Zoom, because uh, one of my friends in Italia in, in Italy sent me a diagram today, and he'd come across it. He wasn't aware that something like it existed. He thought he was showing me something great, new and great, and there's a schematic of it and a picture of it. It's in one of my emails, but I'm afraid if I try to get it, I won't be back for five minutes. You know, it takes <laughs> me so long to navigate this stuff. No, no, it's just I've not come across that before as a specific instrument, but no, that's interesting. Thank you. Well, okay, then you mean my specific one? It's just called an RFM meter, and there are other companies building them too. Um, let me just make a note because I look up, I look up some of these. Uh, yeah, Rick, R I've just put, I've just put in the chat a link to um, G three TXQ Steve's article in Radcom in twenty fifteen on. Uh, oh, that's good, and then everybody mode, can access that. Common yeah. mode currents and chokes and uh, measurements as well. Okay, yeah, well, because and like I said. There's an Go appendix ahead. in his article there on how to measure column mode choke impedance. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's three or four. So, but it, that's probably the, the best because <laughs> I, I assume everyone can access that. So otherwise pop me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll hunt up a couple of the ones and send you a link where you can read it on their respective websites. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, Thank welcome. you, Roger. Richard, Roger. got a question for you. And then I think we'll call questions to, to, to a halt. Come on, Richard. Yeah, good evening, Rick. Nice to uh, nice to meet you again. I've just, yeah, looked in, I've just looked in my drawer. You probably can't see what this is. It's one of your little insulators and two two bits of cable that you gave me, I think, at Newark. And I think you were looking for a different uh, wire manufacturer at that yeah. time. We were, I, I now I can see every now and then it pops into view and then it disappears again. All so, right. yeah, and, and uh, we were... You guys won't believe, um, I'm glad I don't have those headaches anymore. Uh, in the the lightweight and ultra lightweight antennas that Spiderbeam was building, you can't believe how many times we changed the wire because the wire manufacturers kept going out of business or they would be selling out or merging with others and then they'd change their product or discontinue. And then we'd keep changing and then you know we'd build a, a few, say 50 or 100 antennas and then they'd change it again. And every time they change it, even if you had the same part number for the wire, it wasn't quite the same. And so you'd build the antenna and the the SWR curves would be off a little bit. So every time, and it got to the point, even if we ordered from the same vendor, and for the longest time we were ordering from Wireman, then we were ordering from DX Wire. Both of those changed a couple of times. Uh, Spider Beam is now ordering from R Davis RF in the States, uh, Poly Stealth 22. In my opinion, this is the best wire that we've ever used for, for the lightweight stuff. But every time you change the wire, I would have to redefine the dimensions for the boys that are building the antennas. It, it's changed just a few centimeters, but if you don't adjust it, the, the SWR curves aren't where they need to be. It's and, and the same thing happened to us with the thicker wire. And with the coax, it, it's unbelievable. It's you if you're not involved in the manufacturing end of it, it's hard to believe that that happens. You know, wire is wire and coax is coax. It's not, you know. And 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 every time, for me, building an antenna, tuning the antenna, you're talking about a week to two weeks of work for one antenna. And if they change the thin wire, well, I've got three different antennas that use it you know so i've got a couple of months of work just so spider beam can start production again and and by the way they don't have anybody else that does that they they, they still uh i still have to help them on a few things i don't work daily for them but for stuff like that and it doesn't happen often but you know every year every second year i've got to do that yeah brilliant yeah i i use the 404 for the portable work 
um, sat in the car. Yeah. The, only thing, the only thing that I find after transmitting for a while, I just sometimes get a little bit of screen flicker, but, but that's all the SWR never changes. Yeah, then, um, I mean, you could put try putting just a, you know, this Maxwell choke, this camera never works, but if you if just put that uh, right right between the the transceiver and the antenna, that would probably solve it. Well, you probably don't remember, you made me a little one on a, on a toroid. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I do exactly, Richard. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and that one, the, the coax broke, so I, I just bought a big toroid. And I just wind, you know, the end. That's of the fine. End. Just fine. It, you really you don't have to cross wind or anything. They could be wound no. in one direction, but that yeah. should, that should cure that flickering. You know, it, it doesn't happen often. You know, we've sold over, I say we, I'm not with spider beam anymore. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. I'm a civilian, but we have sold over 2000 of those antennas and two times we had to add a choke and you were the lucky winner of one of the times. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you know, one out of a thousand. It's you. So I just wanted to say something. And now I, uh, I, uh, we're going to talk about links. Of course, I'll repeat this next time, but people are always asking me, how long do we cut the antenna? And I said, well, the answer is not in feet and inches, nor meters and centimeters. The answer to that is in megahertz and kilohertz. You know, you cut it to be. Well, here you go with resonance, not resonant, SWR minimum for a certain frequency, and you begin there. And the reason is, if you ch if you use a different wire, it's a different length. But, you know, cutting for that frequency is always the same. So that's, you want it electrically to be at a starting frequency. And I can tell you a ballpark number, but you better be willing to make it 20 centimeters longer or shorter, maybe even more, you know, because it depends on the wire. And I've never worked with... Well, in the last 50 years, I've never used bare wire. I've always used insulated. I don't know how it might affect it if you use bare wire, but it's certainly going to change. But but it's not going to change. My principle is not going to change. As long as you're tuning by, you know, looking at frequency and SWR and stuff like that, that'll work even regardless of what wire you use. Yeah, I, I, the other thing that changes, obviously, when you're out portable, sometimes you get your portable mast up five meters, 10 meters, the angles are different. And, and, and you know, the, the, it does vary it a little bit, but by and large, it's uh, been brilliant. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is when I got into this OCFD stuff, I didn't build these for spider beam. I built them for me. I wanted to, I love portable operations, you know, and I've always been a fan and wire antennas and field days and you know motor biking and going to mountaintops and, and to isle of man and stuff like that and when i built the antenna cornelius the the owner and founder of spider beam in germany he said hey we can sell that and he asked me if i would mind if they sell it i said hey go ahead knock yourself out of course mine was on a um, open frame back plane and he said well we we can't sell that that looks too homemade you know we've got to put it in a case you won't believe it. It took us six months to find a case and get production started. You know, the antenna was finished, but we, because of a, you know, a, a, a three quid or even less, probably a two quid plastic box, it took a six months delay of the production. But, you know, you got to first find one. And we ordered several that we didn't like, and, and they would always send us two or three. And then, but you'd have to buy a couple hundred once you decided you wanted it, you know, and, and then you, you start building them. And then, and then here comes the next bit. So we, we hired a guy to build the antennas. So once we were ready to go, he broke his hand or wrist or something like that. He couldn't do it. And Friedrichshafen was coming up and there was nobody to build them. So I built the first 35 antennas myself and I didn't want anything to do with building them. You know, I, I just designed them. And so Fast forward three or four more years, I designed the 807 antenna because, well, I'd already had, it wasn't so difficult, I already, already had one of my own up, but I changed the feed point. I like the 27 point, no, 29.7 better than, than the thir uh, 20%. So I designed that, it was ready to go. Same guy was going to build them again. We ordered all the parts, he broke his foot. So I built the first 30 807 antennas. <laughs> And uh, Spider Beam didn't pay me for that. I just had to build them. But on the other hand, they they treat me nice. If, if I need a if I need a new pole or something, they send me one. Excellent. Thank you, Richard, and thank yeah. you, Rick. 
Look, everyone, um, I, I think we're just going to call it a day for the uh, recording this presentation from Rick. I think it was mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. superb. And I think, uh, Mike, you were absolutely right. Uh, you need to have a look at the uh, the notes with the handouts and follow some of the links and uh, have a think about it to, to follow it if, uh, uh, if you want to look a bit deeper into it. Uh, but the information is all there. I mean, that's that Rick has done a fantastic job in the last, uh, well, I think 12 months, Rick. That you've We've been working on this for a year. Yeah. We've been working on this for a year. And um, uh, Rick's done a fabulous job of condensing so much information and putting the links into the handout. So uh, congratulations to Rick. Can we can we show our appreciation to Rick uh, for the talk tonight? Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> well, thank you guys for staying with me. It's a uh... Pretty dry. I think the second part will be more fun, you know, when we see how to build them. Okay, so second part is in June, and uh, we'll send out information to remind people of that. So thank you as well to our viewers on YouTube. So I'm going to hit the record button to Just stop. I wish one, everyone a good night. One question for or one one comment first. Seventh of June is my presentation. Please do not put Emil on one day before me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that, Rick. That wasn't the intention originally. That was a special request from Emil. Yeah. This was the only night he was free to do. It. Yeah, yeah, he's he still works. I mean, after all, you know, I I collect rep uh, retirement, so he's paying my salary. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, guys. Yeah, cheers, uh, Adriana. Cheers.